All right. Hello. Thanks for coming to talk with me today. And thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, so today we're going to be discussing your translation of, forgive my pronunciation, Yula Yene's poem Scissors from uh, Hungarian into English, which won runner up for our 11th annual Jules Chemetsky Prize. Congratulations again. Thank you. It's a great honor. <laughs> um, firstly, who or what drove you or drew you to translation? That was a long time ago. So when I was majoring in Russian at Yale, I began translating poetry because I was writing poetry. Poetry was uh, my focus or one of them. And when I was uh, studying Russian and taking courses in Russian poetry, I began translating them. And in fact, my senior essay consisted of translations and commentary. And then one of my professors, Tomas Venslova, who was a Lithuanian poet, uh, he was one of my professors at the time, and in fact, my advisor for my thesis, invited me to translate his poetry, which was actually uh, wonderful for me because I had found his poetry in the library and had wanted to become, uh, to, to to read it more carefully and I didn't speak Lithuanian yet. So I plunged in. And so it's a long story, but anyway, he gave me Russian literal translations and I had the original text, but he also read the original out loud uh, onto tape. So I had tape recordings of the original. I had the original text and I had the Russian literal translations. And with those, I, I would uh, translate in such a way that the, uh, as to in some way simulate the rhythm and the form of the original. That was a long time ago. A book came out of that and then another book and many publications. And after a while, that I, I didn't uh, translate any more of his poetry except on occasion, but here and there informally, and then the translation picked up again when I moved to Hungary. And so Yula Yanez was the, the, the first that I uh, took on seriously uh, here mm -hmm. in Hungary. So. I love the, um, the description of the experience of having all those um, different versions of the poet poem. That way you can um, incorporate all that into your translation. That sounds like a, a really fun experience, actually. Um, so, so it sounds like you had a little translation spree a long time ago and then came back to it. Um, that's accurate. There were some translations in between, and there were times when I was asked to translate something, and times when I translated something informally just because I wanted to. But the, yes, right. there was a large spurt early on, and then much more recently, the Hungarian translations. So, how would you say your um, relationship to translation has changed between then and now, both in terms of uh, your philosophy and your methods and approaches? I will try to keep this short. So <laughs> I think one of the strengths and weaknesses of my translations of Thomas Venslova's poems was my emphasis on the form and my efforts to recreate the form, rhyme, rhythm, sound, and so forth. And in the cases where I did this well, it worked very well. But some of the criticisms of the translation, which I think were in part quite legitimate were that the, the, the English was stilted because I was so I was so focused on the sound of the Lithuanian that I forgot the English in a way. And so that uh, looking back, I see many ways. And when I went back to revise those translations, I saw many ways to loosen this and still preserve what I was trying to do, loosen the rhymes a little bit. And I became more, more attuned to half rhymes, slant rhymes, and so forth, and also to variations in rhythm that are very pleasing and interesting to the ear. And so ways, ways of uh, avoiding the stiltedness and still, doing, and, and still doing something with sound, rhythm, form. And so I, would, uh, I have actually had opportunities to revise those, the, the old translations. So now my approach is much more flexible in terms of, uh, uh, I am less insistent on preserving the exact form, but more, I'd say, a more alert to different ways of 
of simulating it, not exactly, but maybe through some kind of translation of form into something, into something else. And so I see more possibilities, essentially. I've also become more, I've become much fonder of certain free verse, not all free verse, but I've, I've found a love of, of the, free, the kind of free verse that really is not free, because when you look at it, you see that it, it couldn't easily be any other way, that the way it is, is perfect for the poem that came out of it. But also the, uh, the, the playfulness of free verse and the exploratory improvis improvisatory nature of it, I find I, I welcome now in my translation. So I tend more now to translate free verse, though that is not an absolute, and prose as well. In a nutshell, that's it. All right. Um, let's see. So you have worked and studied in a lot of fields um, based on your website. Um, some of them include linguistics, literature, philosophy, theater. Um, you've had musical endeavors, uh, worked in computer programming, editing, yes. <laughs> I'm sure others. How has this breadth of experience influenced your translation work um, and how you view language? I would say the first that comes to mind is the music, certainly the music. And so, for instance, this, this fall, I'm leading a seminar in the US at a literature conference on, and the topic of the seminar is setting poetry to music. And I've been paying attention to this um, closely here in Hungary because music introduces, in addition to the inherent um, form that a poem may have, in form understood in different ways, there are many ways to define form in relation to poetry. The music, if a, when a poem is set to music, the, the music can establish a tempo that is different from what a reader might give it when reading it out loud without music. And I'm very interested in that and the pacing, the tempo of a poem and how that can be felt in the poem itself, uh, independent of the reader's own interpretation and reading out loud. So, so when I read and translate a poem, I am hearing how many beats a word has, how many beats a particular syllable has. And it's not only a matter of stress, there, there, there are syllables that get elongated and syllables that get shortened and, and so forth. And, and, and that's one of the things that happens. And I also hear volume. So I hear increases and decreases in volume and, and the way a poem can build up into commotion of a sort and, and die down into a whisper and, the, and those are the, uh, so, so th that's where the music comes in. As for the rest, I believe that writing in many different, different kinds of writing have all influenced my translation, just whether it's nonfiction, fiction, poetry, uh, all making me uh, more alert to uh, no, the, the, the possibilities within a word, the possibilities in a sentence, the possibilities within a, a larger span of text. And I could go on answering your question, but it would be very long. I, you can if you want. Um, we, I am on the MasterView official account, so it won't boot us out after 40 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I believe that any, that in uh, certainly, in my life, all my interests have in some way tied together. I don't want to co connect them artificially. But mm -hmm. when you, for instance, when you write a computer program, and I did a little bit of this, not very much, but some, you are really, uh, you're, you're looking to give something a structure and you're looking to the essence of what you're trying to do. Right. And so you're, you're, you, you can find all kinds of little ways to work around and to get to where you want to go with the program. And there are very messy programs that, that take roundabout ways. But when you look at the essence of what you're trying to do, you may find either a simpler way, or if not a simpler way, a way that is going to yield more variation and more possibility in and of itself. And so that's that's uh, I believe that connects with translation as well. It's you're you're looking 
it, you're not looking for necessarily the simplest translation. You know, sometimes you, it's a, and this, this comes into play with the, this particular translation. There were times when I translated, the translation is somewhat simpler than the original, and there are times when it's a little bit more complicated. But what you are looking for throughout is a way to go to the essence, uh, and this, this route to the essence should yield the rest as well, the subtleties and the, uh, the changes of, of, of tone. All, everything else that's in the poem to the extent possible should be yielded by this route to the essence. If that, uh, yeah. that's the, the connection that I can see with computer program. However, they are quite different other than that. Mm -hmm. I was gonna ask you specifically about that because that was uh, very interesting to me. Um, I also loved what you said about um, translations connected connection to music. I started out as a teenager translating songs, um, so I had a similar experience, and it was it was um, rewarding. Um, let's see, so you've talked a little bit. You you have worked with Russian, Lithuanian, Hungarian. This poem is from Hungarian. Um, do you first of all, how did you choose these languages to, to focus they on? They chose me. They absolutely <laughs> chose me. And so, I mean, that's, uh, I, I've always uh, in, been drawn to languages, enjoyed mm -hmm. them, been drawn to them, wanted to learn them from childhood. When I was a little kid, I, well, my the first spoken, the first language I spoke, but I don't remember any of it was Portuguese because we lived in Brazil when I was a baby and that was what I began speaking. But then we came back to the US and I continued with English. And um, we lived in the Netherlands when I was 10 and we lived in Moscow when I was 14. And that's how I uh, learned Russian was when we were living in Moscow for a year. But I definitely chose to learn it because it would have been possible and fairly easy to spend a year there without learning much Russian because they have an embassy school that's possible to get by just speaking English. The same is true in Hungary, by the way. So uh, I insisted on uh, going to a, a a Russian school, which actually specialized in French, so I could continue the French. So, so language is in part of my life, and I took Latin and Greek in high school, and uh, and th that's. But I always wanted to go further with the the challenge of a language and go beyond what's normally considered fluent into a deeper knowledge. And so, with Hungarian, when I came here to teach, and that's a whole other story about how I came, but I came here without knowing any Hungarian, and that was five years ago. And I was determined to learn, but I also knew that one year wasn't enough, definitely not enough. Two years wasn't going to be enough. You know, by two years, you're probably conversing simply, but fairly competently on certain a certain limited number of subjects and you can handle text with a dictionary and so forth but I wanted much more than that and I'm in the midst of that yes and so they found me the Lithuanian again found me because of uh, Ventslava inviting me to translate his poetry and I took Lithuanian and uh, plunged into it but I don't speak Lithuanian very well I can handle base, some basic conversation maybe at this point um have you encountered or like have you taken had to take different approaches to different languages hmm. that's difficult to say it's uh each one is its own yes it's each one is its own world <laughs> it's right it's very, it's very hard to describe each one has its particular resonance, its particular way of working. I would say um, there are concepts that in certain languages are very difficult to translate accurately. And for instance, and time, the way time is expressed in different languages is prof can be profoundly different. Mm -hmm how you and even simple simple matters as how you express the future or the past differ so strongly from language and even the present and and gradations of present and future uh, that, that 
it, it, it creates a serious dilemma. And this was one of the most interesting aspects of translating Yenai's poetry uh, and particularly scissors is how do you handle this future in which the poems are, you, see, you know what I mean? The future with which the poem begins, right? Yes, yeah. my grandmother will have other scissors too. And it, what's why will have, and that could strike the reader as strange, but this was done on purpose, but it, it, it sounds a little different in Hungarian. I it was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. It definitely sounds like an intentional, definite future tense being used, but somehow softer, it's somehow a little bit more present like than the will of the English language. Mm -hmm. And so I, I struggled with that a little bit, but then decided let just go for the strangeness here and let the reader come into it. Well, uh, that segues pretty well into my next question, which is, um, were there features of the Hungarian that you wanted to um, highlight or preserve in the translation? Yes, well, time was one of the key ones. And so the, 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 the first challenge was definitely deciding where to use the, the, the will to convey the future because the entire premise, the premise of the entire book, Bindig Mash, always different is that the author at around age 50 imagines himself as a 10 year old looking forward into the future and seeing things as they actually do unfold. So there's a little bit of a prophetic tinge, but mixed with that, all the uncertainties of memory, not being at many moments along the way, not really being sure whether it was this or that, or when exactly things happened or whether certain things happened at all. So it's a tiny bit of prophecy, a lot of uncertainty mixed in, and then a kind of a matter of fact narration of everyday life that yet has so many layers and so many, so, so many uh, layers of history, of family relationships, of a changing society, a society in a world that's changing right around the boy, and he may or may not be aware of it as it's happening. And so, yes, so, so one of the challenges for me was um, capturing this sense of future and present and past and finding the right gradations and transitions between them. And so also the another question that I think that comes up in any uh, translation is uh, to what extent to clarify any references for the reader. And in this case, for this particular poem, I didn't, I just expected that readers would know about the Austro-Hungarian Empire and their various references to that throughout the poem, that the historical references would not be so obscure that they would need a note or anything like that. In the preface to the book, not the preface, but the translators afterward to the book, I explained a few of the other references in the po literary references, but that's always a, a question, how, how uh, how much clearer to make it for a, a reader who's not immersed necessarily in, in that culture and history. The uh, uh, other, the, I guess, one of the aspects, the features that I love about the Hungarian language is the word order, which is so different from the English. And of course I had to change that, but not everywhere. There were ways where I could keep things more or less in the Hungarian sequence. And I enjoyed when that was possible. And, and also, although this is free verse, the line breaks are important. When they happen is important. It isn't random, you play around with it, you change it a little and you see that the poem is different. So more or less taking grammar into account and taking word order into account here and in other Yenai poems, I um, followed where I could the locations of the line breaks. And if I couldn't, then I simulated them in some other way. 
And then there are word plays and there are word inventions and word conglomerations that occur. And so and that happens near the end of this poem. And there I tried to do something similar in English. And, uh, and then I will say that there are times when I would actually break with the original in some way. So one example is the very end of this poem. So the, the, the very last two words, um, the, in Hungarian, it's bikabeli boldog talanság, and then in English, it's unhappy peacetime. And you hear that. So the literal translation of the Hungarian of the last two words in the Hungarian would be peacetime unhappiness. And I switched it around and turned it into unhappy peacetime. And I spent a lot of time deliberating that, del deliberating that which would be better. And it seemed to me that unhappy peacetime was a somewhat familiar, it was a phrase with some res resonance. It seemed that peacetime unhappiness for the ending of the poem seemed a little bit too convoluted in the English speaking ear. So although it does invert the, 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 the meaning slightly, I believe here still the essence is preserved. Do you have an example um, of the line where you were able to keep the Hungarian syntax? Yes, so let me see just a moment. Let's see. Well, it's impossible to keep it completely. Of so, course. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, absolutely, but there's, there's no way. But in the very beginning, I would say more or less I did. So the, the first two lines, um, in fact, the, the first four lines, more or less follows the, not exactly but very closely follows not only the syntax but the the location of the line breaks as well and so the the, the places so there i followed it as much as possible and then um there are it, it's so it's difficult to go into the details because, for example, so well, I'll just give an example here. So my grandmother will have other scissors too. Just to give an example, in the Hungarian, it's not onyam not teb oloya ish les. And so literally that would be to my grandmother, several or more scissors also will be, which sounds like a very different word order, but actually it's much closer. It's relatively close. So my grandmother will have other scissors too. And then, and then it proceeds from there, a similar kind of closeness. Uh, but for example, the fourth line, they have been looking at each other for a hundred years. You don't, you can omit the pronoun uh, in Hungarian, so you don't have to say they. So nak saz evig ish. Uh, and so I would have to go into a detailed explanation of Hungarian grammar. So there are omissions and additions that happen in the translation, as well as uh, a following of or departure from the syntax, but more or less that opening is close. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. So you have translated a lot of Yula Yane's poetry, right? Yes. Um, and you said you were attracted to freeform poetry, so I'm sure that's part of what drew you to his poetry. Um, but was uh, is can you tell us a little bit more about why you decided to translate him? Yes. And first to to clarify about uh, freeform poetry and and. Free verse that I don't is not exclusively that I love it, but I've come to appreciate it more over time and to be more drawn to it over time. But certainly, I I love formal verse at least as much. Well, when I came to Hungary, I began teaching in Solnok, which is it's a city as much in this almost as much in the center as you can get of Hungary, center slightly south, and so it's to the slight south and east of Budapest. And it's about, a, say, an hour and a half away by train or a little bit less. 
And so I began teaching where I still teach at a high school, the Barra Catalin Gymnasium. And for a whole year there, I had no idea that I had colleagues who were poets, but actually there are at least two. And, and I had no idea for a year that one of them, Yanai, uh, was invite, regularly inviting Hungarian writers to the school to speak with students. And a student eventually told me about this. And I eventually found out that he was a poet and found my way, started reading the poetry. And the thing was that it immediately, I wanted, I memorized a poem right away. And my first conversation with him, I simply walked up to him and recited a poem of his that I memorized. It was an unusual first, first conversation. Uh, he was quite surprised. You know, it's not something that you necessarily expect at a day at school, um, but pleased. And, and then I started reading the longer ones from this collection, and I was uh, absorbed in it to the extent that I thought this should be a translation. And so I, and his wife also is a critic and has written some beautiful uh, pieces of criticism. And there was one essay that was actually about another Hungarian poet's haiku verse, haiku poems. And so she discussed these haiku and, and what, they, what they meant and how they connected together and what the, the volume as a whole was saying. And I wanted to translate at that as well. So with, as well as the haiku poems. So I approached them both and I said, look, I'd like to translate some poems of Yane and some of, and I'd like to translate this essay and they were delighted. And at this point, uh, I spoke almost no Hungarian. I, I mean, I spoke a little bit of Hungarian, but very little. And so the first time I met with them, they invited me over to their apartment and we had dinner together and talked about the translation. And his wife, Marianna, was uh, translating a lot of the time. And there were these wonderful, awkward silences <laughs> where, I couldn't say anything that I wanted to say and, and they didn't know what to say to me, but it was just great, a friendship was formed. And another thing that happened during this, I believe it was the first meeting, but maybe the second, here again, the uncertainty of memory coming into play is that uh, they started for the, one of his poems is radio, which is about a radio and about the family, uh, listening to the radio at home and the, the different the, the different shows and, and, and hearing the news that Kennedy was shot, you know, as a little boy hearing this news and how that changed his, his a tiny child's view of the world. But then later realizing it was not JFK, it was Robert Kennedy uh, who was shot and the, at that time that he heard it on the radio. But then talking about the uh, different shows on the radio and he as a little boy believing that the sound was coming from little people who lived inside the radio and wondering how they lived and how they managed to do everything in that little box. But there was a song that was mentioned, the poem that's mentioned in the poem, and they played an old recording of this song for me. And so, and they actually also showed me the scissors, the very scissors that are the subject of this poem, and so through uh, of scissors. And so I held the scissors, I heard the song, and through these different conversations, um, we, I, I came into contact with the, the authors and also with the, uh, the tangible aspects of these poems. And, and I, I got to, I came to know a little bit more about the, the, the life surrounding and underlying them. That sounds great. <laughs> Yes, it was. And yeah. to this day, to this day, we continue now much more fluent, much more uh, uh, longer conversations. Right. Did you have like a, a section or line that um, you sort of built your translation off of for scissors or um, did you just um, take the whole poem in and start from the beginning? Uh, I took the whole poem in and started from the beginning. And I remember that day clearly because that was the year when, that was in 2018, 2019. And it, so it was either in the late fall of 2018 or the, the, the winter of 2019 
one or the other. And I had a long break in the day on Wednesdays when there were several hours between one class and the next. And I would go to a completely deserted cafe, cafe that was completely silent. And I had my dictionaries with me and I had my, my notebook with me and I would just sit. And that is where I would uh, write the first drafts of the translations. And then I would go and refine them later. But I remember that uh, being there and, and I was uh, so in, engrossed in this poem and the translation for several hours that that afterwards I I didn't know how I was going to go out and go out back into school back into the world but but it it worked out I was able to um, but but yes it was that uh, and and I the the I would say the part that really to this day I I wouldn't say it puzzles me, but but it seems that I can turn it in so many different ways, is that uh, towards the end of the poem, when the poem says that I'm not interested, having no interest in the question of power or of birthplace either, this cannot be quite correct. I should disambiguate this having no interest and explain why not. And, and, and so this pause, and uncertainty over his own words and a wish to clarify what he actually meant by that. But then that, that clarifying and that specification, he then relates to the sanding and polishing of the scissors. So that's a curious twist. You, know, you think that when you clarify a point, you're actually drawing finer lines into it. But in this case, it, it results or in some way being compared. There's an analogy between that and wearing the faces down, making the faces less distinct rather than more. But then in another twist, what emerges from that is the basic essence of these two faces, faces on a, piece, on a pair of scissors, unhappy peacetime. And, and so there, there are several twists in this line of thinking, but if you, if you follow them, you come to something magnificent every day, some kind of everyday magnificence. Right, right. It's not a clarifying of detail, but rather of the whole picture. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I also love that section. Um, so my final question to you is, um, that because the Chemetsky Prize is in part a response to the quote, great need for literary journals to internationalize. Um, uh, is there, going into this, did you have a, a vision for what you wanted to give your audience, um, give an international audience? I wanted the audience to be able to, to to enter this poem and love it as though it, it as not as though it had been written in English, but as though they were reading the Hungarian in some way, or maybe some combination of the two. I wanted it uh, to be str strange, but in a way that is enterable, and uh, the in a, in, a, in such a way that that when you read the poem, you end up having sat next to the grandmother as as she's cutting with her various scissors and and playing with the scissors and 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 then sensing the the, the past dissolving and and the grandmother being buried and time going by the sweep of history the long sweep of history and the shorter sweep of history and these things remaining there's something about this this poem that is on the it's it it has the, something that's so specific and at the same time something that that people can live as they read it and so and, and that's I think it's probably a simple thing to say but that's that's part of what translation should do right it should bring out the specifics of that language that culture that way of life and at the same time there should be some way for the reader to enter it and be glad for having entered it. Absolutely. All right, that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop the recording.